Uh, good morning, everybody. First of all, I would thanks. Uh, I would like to convey my thanks to the organizing committee of the conference 2021 for this wonderful platform where we could all be together and share each other's views on various aspects of development and nurturing the physiotherapy profession. I'll not like to spend a lot of time uh, talking about other things. I'll go straight away to my uh, lecture here. Just give me a second. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about on ankle and subtalar alignment restorations by manipulation, which is very uh, instrumental in correcting the body alignment. Already my uh, introduction has been given by uh, the posts, and that was done very wonderfully. So just a few slides that were made prior to that. I've been trying to learn from the best in the world, and I've been trying to reach out a lot of young physios to train them. I've been taking workshops, including, uh, included in this list are Korea, Thailand, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. So let's go to what we are going to talk about today, manipulative therapy. First of all, let me break that little belief that manipulative therapy is just cracks. It's been a thought process that everybody believes that manipulation means that you put a joint into position and there's a sound which comes just like the cracking of the knuckles like this. Now, as you can see in this slide, this is the synovial fluid which is present in most of the joints which we are treating. And when we crack our joint, the space between the two bones of the joint increases. And as a result of which, the gases which are dissolved inside the joint, they are going to go into a low pressure zone and they tend to pop up out of the joint, very much like these bubbles which come out when we open a bottle of a soda. And this gives this cracking nature. Not only this gives a cracking nature, but it also gives a temporary feeling of well-being because it releases along with carbon dioxide, it releases nitrous oxide, which is a potent vasodilator. So that thing gives you a wonderful feeling of well-being and then it gives a satisfaction to the manipulator that he has achieved something. But in reality, this is not true about manipulation. I've put a list of four or five different articles out here. And it was the time which made a constraint for me to put up more articles, which says that this cracking is not actually essential for correcting a bone which has gone out of alignment. That there's more what we need is to correct the position of the bone, which has misaligned from its original position, or what we call it as it has gone in a chiropractic term, they call it subluxation, and physiotherapy, we call it as misalignment. So that crack may also not be happening at the area where we intended to get it. Maximum times, the joint which is stiff, which is been locked into a position of fault is so hypermobile, so whatever we try, we do not actually are able to move unless we are very sure that we are manipulating exactly at the same segment where we want to do that, and we get a pop from a neighboring segment where there is no problem. And then such kind of popping of the sounds can also have some bizarre outcomes. Like if you see this gentleman, he has a habit of self-manipulating himself. So you'll say, what is wrong in that? If he can himself manipulate. So what's wrong in that? The wrong is that this uncontrolled thing has resulted in he getting hypermobility over time.
So you can see how his neck became hypermobile by he doing the uncontrolled manipulation, which did not have any purpose. And then I always say, even a barber manipulates. But then remember, this was published in Times of India when a barber manipulated, he resulted in uh, creating a crack on the uh, bone, and that resulted in uh, damaging the person, and which eventually resulted to, in a stroke. Now, let's go to the area where we want to focus today. The limitation of movement in the foot, what cascading effects it can have. This is uh, a systemic review where it shows that if there's a limited dorsiflexion, it could lead to increased pronation of the foot, and in turn, it can cause increased internal rotation of tibia, internal uh, hip rotation, pelvic drop, and thus kind of, uh, causing dynamic knee valgus. So this is what could happen once a uh, joint is misaligned. And not only that, it can lead to cascading effects up in the body where the limited dorsiflexion could have led to excessive trunk bending and increase in your pelvic tilt. So this is what uh, we are here to focus about. Now, excessive pronation or a fallen arch. Now, what effects it can have on the body today? Pronation is a normal process. Every time I take a step, I land upon my foot. My foot has to go into pronation and this is to keep the bumping effect to keep away the stress to come on the upper limb joints. So it's a sort of a effect which negotiates away my ground reaction force. And this pronation helps me to dampen the forces that have been coming on the lower limb ground, on the ground. So every time I take a step and I'm on to a stance phase, the pronation comes every time. I go into the swing phase, the pronation goes away. And this is how every step pronation comes and goes. So I'm not worried about pronation, I'm worried about over pronation. Now this over pronation can have a local effect like it can cause heel spurs, it can result in hellus velcus and bunions, it can be a cause for echelous tendonitis and maybe treating echelous tendonitis and it's not been responding. Why it has not been responding? Because the problem lies somewhere else. It results in corns and callosities and toes, hematos. Why? Because there's an excessive weight bearing on that area. It could result in navicular apophysitis, shin splints, stress fractures, medial knee joint pain, patellofemoral dysfunction, and it will cause your innominate bone of the ilium to rotate anteriorly and resulting in hip pain. And once the base or the foundation of your body is disturbed, the entire body gets into dysfunction and you can get a spinal dysfunction. Your entire posture has a catastrophically devastating outcome. And why it happened? Because your foot went into overpronation. As you can see in these two animations, there is the rotation in the knee, the tibia goes into internal rotation, the fibula goes, uh, sorry, femur goes into internal rotation, the ilium goes anteriorly, and the knee goes into a misalignment as well, and the shoulder and the head all get a compensatory fault. So my little chain in my foot can have these big effects because my body would always try to compensate one area by bringing a change in the other area so that my head stays balanced. Now, this pronation, as you all know, you're all physios, so you all know it takes place in two joints, one at the subtalar joint and second at the mid tarsal joint. So my first job is to identify the problem is occurring, whether it's the subtalar or at mid tarsal, which I can do by doing a manual examination, 
where I fix one area and grasp and move the other area. I could do with a radiological examination where I can find out the problem is not only in which area, but I also find out to what extent the problem is there. With these chiropractic and osteopathic techniques, we can find all misalignments in any joint using an X-ray analysis. We can do with certain other trusts like biomechanical markings, navicular drop test. Uh, then we can do a calcaneal segmental analysis. So we can do with various tests, or we can do a dynamic test, which would be a little difficult to demonstrate here. But uh, what I learned over the years is not a static fault, which troubles me more, but a dynamic overpronation, which gives me more trouble. Now, to elaborate it further, the misalignment in the mid-tarsal or the sub-tarsal area comes from various different components. And if I have to be a good manipulative therapist to correct it, I should very much find out where exactly the problem lies. It's just like if the light in a room is not working, sometimes it's the bulb which is not fused. Or at times, the light is not coming from the electricity station or sometimes it's the switch which is got damaged. So similarly, you have one outcome, but the, this, the process could be multifactorial. So what are the different kinds of uh, uh, subluxations or articular faults that could lead to a, a holding of the foot into excessive pronation? It could be a navicular bone, which is misaligned in the inferior and medial direction. It could be the cuboid bone, which could misalign superiorly and laterally. It could be cuneiforms, which have, might have gone inferiorly. The metatarsals, second, third, and fourth, anywhere could be misaligned inferiorly. Metatarsal, first and fifth, could go superior and lateral, or very commonly, the talus goes and stays anterior and lateral. The calcaneum could be everted and plantar flexed, and the fibular hit, because the fibula maintains a very integral part in the subtalar mechanics because the mortise can open and close by one or four mm. So the fibular head, when it is mistreated and lateral, can also maintain a pronation fault in the foot. So I need to evaluate that. And I have various tools and methods by which I can do this kind of thing. The chiropractors use the word subluxation for a misalignment. So that is what we are trying to do. We can use the X-rays. We can use a lot of uh, static dynamic palpation tests. We use leg length tests. We use uh, applied kinesiology, motion palpations, and various methods by which we find out. But before I go ahead and talk about the manipulative method, let me tell you a manipulation actually would mean is that you need to cross this restrictive barrier without crossing this anatomical barrier. So if I, so if you see, my objective for a good HVT would be to take it to the barrier where it is restricted, where the joint has gone into hypermobility and it's struck, and, but ensure that I just go from this little range to this little range. I by no means cross this anatomical barrier. Once I cross this anatomical barrier, I can damage ligaments and also cause a lot of increase in pain and other issues with the joint. So a good manipulation is, is like what we call it, a high velocity, low amplitude, very much like this car being driven. So if you see, this car is going on a very high speed, and suddenly you have to apply those brakes to not to bang in the cars ahead. So that is what exactly a good HVT technique is. And sometimes the fear of not being able to control that last minute motion does not allow many of us to 
may not play the joint nicely because we have a fear that by chance we may break into this anatomical barrier. So today I intentionally picked up a device which is called as a extremity drop, which ensures that when you're manipulating, you will have an automatic braking system and which will never allow the bones to cross over the anatomical zone. And I'm teaching you the manipulation, but that doesn't mean that manipulations without the drop won't be done. So you have to use the same thing, but you have to have this control where you go at a high speed and then you stop suddenly. So let's go to finding some of the common misalignments in the foot. As I said, first could be an inferior medial navicular bone. You could see how the bone could come down. And if it's struck, you could do it on your own foot, try to take the foot into pronation and feel your navicular bone goes down. So every time I take my foot into pronation, my navicular bone goes down. But the problem is in the people who have hypermobility it doesn't go back. And that is what doesn't allow them to come out of this hyperpronation. So the, this bone is going up and down with every step, but if it stays here, it doesn't go back. This is, I need to trust. And what will it do if it doesn't go back? It can give me a medial longitudinal arch pain. Of course, we have already talked about it leads to excessive pronation. It usually, such patients have history of ankle sprains. And I want good sign would be edema over the torso medial aspect of the foot. So if I find them, I try to push the navicular bone superior and lateral, and I'm not able to get the joint play. It gives me a firm end feel that is the time I should manipulate this bone. So this is, I'm showing you on a drop piece, how I can do that. So, I'm standing uh, on the lower side of the couch where the patient is placed. Now the patient is lying on his side so that the uh, lower leg is now being the side of this function, the foot. I'm uh, placing on this uh, little drop mechanism, which I've talked about the extremity drop, which is now very easily available in India. And now I'm going to place my pisiform of the adjusting hand on the navicular bone, which has come inferior and medial, and I want to thrust it superior and lateral. So I further take it now with my other hand, I take the foot and I thrust, uh, I take the foot into a zone where I could, uh, I take the foot into the zone where I could get the barrier easily felt. And once I've get, got the barrier, I'm going to thrust it straight down like this. So I'm going to play this now with the sound on. Right, so this, this was the first correction we made. Now, the second correction we need to do is for an everted calcaneum. The problem is same. We are getting overpronation, but it could be because now my calcaneum has gone laterally. And again, if you do in your own foot, you can feel that when you do pronation, your calcaneum tends to go laterally. But again, if it doesn't come back, it is struck. I need to treat the calcaneum rather than the navicular bone. And the indications apart from overpronation could be plantar fasciitis, eversion, ankle injuries, heel pains, and pain in the medial longitudinal arch. A conclusive sign could be uh, tenderness below the lateral malleolus, decreased eversion range. This is very important, medial unilateral heel wear. And of course, history of uh, chronic ankle sprains and Achilles tendonitis we've already talked about. So once I have found that, that now, this is a normal manipulating way, which I uh, don't have a video, but I'm thrusting it straight down back 
towards the medial side, the calcaneum has gone laterally. So watch my hand if it's coming medially. The other hand is a sporting hand, which takes uh, the foot into the barrier and I thrust it straight down. But this is how I could do with the drop piece. Now the patient is on the affected side on the top. So you could see how we could uh, thrust up lateral calcaneum. And then the anterior lateral talus. This is very, very important uh, misalignment which you get in the foot. Not only is very critical for your foot to be staying in overpronation, but it is very critical also for treating ankle sprains. Now, uh, if you bring a patient to me who has an ankle sprain in the last 24 to 48 hours, I can bet that not only his pain will be reduced by more than 50% in the first session, but the person who was not able to walk properly would go with ease walking. I have treated so many patients in early stages after the sprain has happened, if they come to me, many people have run on the very next day. Though the traditional practice was to put the joint into immobilization and let the ligament heal. But I tell you, even on my own daughter, I've done this. That's wonderful results in a single session the patient is more than 50% better and at times almost 80 to 90% better. So this is one of the uh, faults which we correct in ankle sprains. I call it a six point protocol for ankle sprains, but today we are only covering uh, foot pronation. So the key indications is ankle sprains, excessive pronation, decreased range of motion. Remember if the talus is anterior to the strict dorsiflexion and the important signs to watch would be tendon and swelling of the dorsal lateral aspect of the ankle in the region of the sinus torsi. So once you find that, we go and we thrust the talus back into its position. So I thrust from my outside hand, which is placed late uh, outside the uh, aspect of the foot. I place my junction between the metacarpal and the phalanx at the patient's uh, head and neck of talus, which is like a dimple on the lateral side of the foot, and thrust with that into a little bit medial and posterior direction. That is how we correct an interior lateral talus. Similarly, my inferior cuneiforms could give me pain at the metatarsal joints, tenderness and the plantar aspect of the foot. There's a loss of joint play between the cuneiforms and the metatarsals on examination, and I could use the same drop mechanism to correct it. And the last one, which we are going to talk about today, is the superior lateral cuboid. Now, the cuboid, again, can go uh, be misaligned in either direction. Most commonly, though, it would be misaligning in the inferior direction, which we call as cuboid syndrome. But with foot pronation falls, it tends to go superior and lateral, like this. So if this shocking doesn't come back, you can have a lateral foot pain. This could follow an inversion ankle sprain, and you have a fixated foot pronation, that's what we are trying to treat. So we could thrust that like this back. So once you do that, you're not able to just correct the local problems of the patient, but you're able to treat a lot many problems which are cascading up the spine. Now, uh, I always believe on this principle that alone manipulations won't fix anything. So I believe on this principle, which we call it as ART. ART stands for A for adjustment, that is manipulation. ART stands for relief, and P stands for training. So if a structure is pulsed, um, moved out of the alignment because of the tight muscle, it will again go into faults unless we release those features. And if we release, and the patient has a habit of taking the foot into that faulty position, uh, in his daily work, again, this will create 
the muscle becoming tight and the bone going into misalignment. So I have to train him if he's taking the foot into one direction to unwind the foot by taking it to other direction. Like for one instinct, I had a lot of pain in my thoracic spine sometime back because I used to bend a lot. So when I used to got manipulate, uh, get myself manipulated, it used to fix my pain, but it was very temporary. So then I released the structures on the anterior side of my body, my rectus abdominis, my sternalis, my SCM. So it gave me a more better effect, but still, because I have to bend a lot, I've been a very tall person, I tend to used to get these problems again and again. So what I do is to do a backward bending while trying to push my ziphy sternum downwards every day morning, only four times. And that's what, for the last three, three and a half years, I never had this patient problem. And this is with my patients. So once you treat them with the manipulation, you need to find which muscle, 90% of the times it's the muscles in today's world which are responsible for getting the bone out of alignment. 10% of the time it's trauma. So those 90% of the patients need to be taught which muscles should be released. And once they're taught on the muscles to be released, they need to be given a habit where if they're doing one side pronation, they need to do a foot few times in supination in a day. So what muscles should we work about is, this is the sling which we have. This is a natural sling, if you see. On one side of the foot, it's been a little uh, error here. The peroneus and the tensor fascia later will come on the lateral side and the tibialis interior and the adductors will be on the medial side. So there's a little misprinting here, but this is one sling that tends to facilitate and the peroneus on the one side. So if they are tied, they're going to take the foot into pronation. And if tibialis interior and adductors are weak, they are going to allow that. So I need to work on this sling because this is very important thing. That is why God made you have your peroneus cross over and go to the uh, peroneus longer cross over and go to the medial side of the foot and attach where the tibialis interior is attached. This is the sling which controls the pronation and supination. So I need to deactivate the peroni muscles. I need to release them and we do a very dynamic release which we call as myokinetics. Uh, I've been trained into MFR, but I believed a dynamic release where the motion could be done and it's more functional, helps you get a better result. And then we activate the tibialis interior and train the patient to reverse this process of pronation by doing a few exercises on its own, which includes strengthening of his intrinsic muscles of the foot, strengthening of his inverters, and a few other things. So that's all I wanted to share with you all. And uh, I think the right kind of things that you do, as uh, my predecessor, Dr. Bhave said, it's not about doing the thing in a single time. It's over time when we do the right things, it will change. Whether it's corona or any structural fault in the body, it does take time and the right understanding of the mechanism which brings it. So if I do the right things today, I'll get the better results tomorrow. Thank you very much for giving a patience listening to me. And I want to thank you, the organizers, for this wonderful opportunity.